19th, 2015. Hope you had a good weekend. With one down, four to go, let's get into some far-out radio. We have a new guest for you this evening. His name is Walter Bosley, and he's one of the presenters at the 2015 Secret Space Program Conference being held in Austin, Texas, on October the 31st and November the 1st. You know, what is so refreshing about the Secret Space Program Conference is the general attitude and position of the group that is basically saying, we don't need government disclosure. We can gather our own data. We can analyze and access and draw our own conclusions. Thank you very much. No, we're no longer going to wait for NASA to parse out what's going on. Uh, after all, we never get a straight answer from them anyway. Of course, uh, we can thank Richard Hoagland for the uh, tagline, never a straight answer. That's what NASA means. You know, the official birth of modern ufology is 68 years old. Uh, back on June the 31st, 1947 is when private pilot Kenneth Arnold reported seeing nine unusual objects in the sky while flying over Mount Rainier in Washington State. Arnold originally described the objects thusly, flat like a pie pan, shaped like a pie plate, half moon shaped oval in the front and convex in the rear. Something like a pie plate cut in half with sort of a convex triangle in the rear, or simply saucer-like, or like a big flat disc. Arnold also described the object's erratic motion being like a fish flipping in the sun, or a saucer skipping across the water. From these descriptions, the press quickly coined the new terms flying saucer, and flying disc to describe such objects, many of that were reported within days after Arnold's initial sighting. Now, the Kenneth Arnold sighting may well have faded into obscurity were it not for what happened just a week and a half later, on July the 8th, 1947, in Roswell, New Mexico. Yes, the famous Roswell incident. Of course, the Air Force didn't help things in the Public Relations Department anyway because they issued an official press release that said a flying saucer had crashed near Roswell. Now, if you've been following the subject of UFOs, the Roswell story is very, very well known. And unless you seriously dig deep, it's easy to conclude that these incidences of 1947 were the beginning of the UFOs visiting this planet. But ah, uh, not so fast. On February the 25th, 1942, not quite three months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, there was a frightful incident that took place over the night skies of Los Angeles when something that was not a conventional plane or a blimp slowly moved across the night sky of L.A. County. Air raid sirens were sounded. The city went into blackout from 3.16 a.m. to 4.14 a.m., when over 1,400 anti-aircraft shells were fired, plus 50 caliber machine guns blazed in the night sky. By 721, the blackout was lifted, and later that day, the Los Angeles Times, or the Los Angeles Examiner's headline read, Air Battle Rages Over Los Angeles. The LA Times headline read, LA Area Raided. And the Glendale Press headline was, Anti-aircraft guns blast at L.A. Mystery Invader. So, was this the beginning of uh, the legitimately reported sightings of strange things flying in the sky? Uh, no. <laughs> From there, you have to go back, you have to get into the Wayback Machine. you got to roll back another 45 years to Aurora, Texas, the airship incident of April 1897. But wait, but wait, there's more. Our guest, Walter Bosley, has researched the subject and concluded that the story goes back to what is called the great airship mystery of the 1850s to the 1890s. Now, Walter Bosley has written a three-part book series titled Empire of the Wheel, as well as his other books, Secret Missions, The Hidden Legacy of Old California, and his two books from 2015, Latitude 33, The Key to the Kingdom, and most recently, as of last July, The Lost Expedition of Sir Francis Burton. Now, in order to understand the modern secret space program, it is essential that we have a clear, longer perspective of what's been going on in the skies 
And Walter Bosley is with us tonight to help deepen our understanding of this amazing story. Now, after 19 years in the business of national security, Walter is today a licensed investigator in California. He owns a small publishing company called Lost Continent Library. And you can follow Walter's work at the website lostcontinentlibrary.blogspot.com. You know, when looking into topics such as this, it is essential, I believe, to remember the words of Mark Twain when he said, truth is stranger than fiction because fiction is obligated to stick to possibilities. Truth isn't. Walter, welcome to Far Out Radio. Hey, Scott, it's great to be here, finally. I'm looking forward to our talk. Indeed, I have, I have been, too. I'm, I, I love the uh, stories of days gone by, and uh, this is just a really cool story here. Now, Walter, just for grins, I went to Amazon.com and I did a search for just the term UFOs in brackets. Mm -hmm. And I came up with, or or, uh, Amazon came up with, 18,582 books with UFOs in the title with so much material focused on post-1947 events. How did you get into things that happened nearly 100 years before that? Well, <laughs> uh, big stories always begin with a well, right? And a sigh. Um, I, you know, w- we've always heard occasionally of these uh, uh, of the airship mystery. It comes up, and, and people think of blimps or dirigibles, and, and they assume that, well, perhaps these were the, the early days of just, you know, the Zeppelins and such, and, and they forget about it. Or the airship mystery of the 1890s gets written off as a newspaper hoax. Right. Um, what what happened for me was that after I uh, completed with my co-author Rick Spence the first Empire of the Wheel book, um, there had been a nagging thread uh, that looked like it tied to some stuff I'd heard about a group in the 1850s, but uh, you know, admittedly, didn't know a whole lot about them. And uh, after Empire of the Wheel one, when I pulled that thread. I discovered that there was a whole lot more to this uh, airship mystery issue in the in the 1800s, not just in the 1890s, but as mentioned in the 1850s. And the more I looked at it, the more I found that um, it was a phenomenon, or or milieu is a better word for it, just a, a collection of, of strange facts and and theories that indeed went back to the decade before the U.S. Civil War. And um, it, it really begins with a guy named Charles Delschau, a, a German immigrant who came to California in the uh, middle to late 1850s, and he wrote about a very secretive group that built rudimentary little flying contraptions that allegedly used um, like an anti-gravity technology. Um, Now, this is the 1850s, and this group was a group of German immigrants in California that were supposedly, according to Delschau, building these things under the aegis, under the supervision of uh, this mysterious German-based group called NIMSA. Well, um, the more I looked at that... The, the more it connected to the 1890s airship mystery. And, and I, I came really quick to learn that uh, what was being seen in the 1890s were not blimps. They were not dirigibles. They were distinctly something else. And there were so many newspapers that had reported these sightings of, of so many witnesses, hundreds, in major cities, that um, the more you look at it, the the, the, the it soon becomes apparent that this was no newspaper man's hope, uh, in all honesty. But um, it, uh, it, it gave me a different perspective on the whole 20th century experience of the UFO and what's been flying in our skies and who's been flying them. Hmm. 1850s anti-gravity technology from Germany. Hmm. Well, where else would it come from? <laughs> <laughs> That's the story from well, the, I mean, the... All you have to do is just, I mean, forget the politics and all that aside. Just study the hardware uh, on both sides of the conflict for World War II, and the Germans were just so far ahead of everybody else, it was just absurd. Right, 
Right. And, and that's, that's what I'll be presenting in Texas in my, my talk there is the thread that ties all this airship mystery technology to what was going on in the early 20, 20th century, and especially with what uh, Nazi Germany was doing and how it uh, links to the post-World War II era. I, I'm, I'm going to be starting out with a, um, a slide in my presentation, and, and I'll share the content of that here. And basically, it's a statement. It says that um, the breakaway civilizations and the secret space programs, which, they, which we suspect they've created, did not originate with Nazi Germany. They did not originate in the post-World War II military-industrial complex era. And they did not originate with the reverse engineering of an ET craft. They originated with these secretive, mysterious, industrialist mystics who were toying around with this technology in its rudimentary phase. Industrialist mystics that's a new one i've never heard of before mm. well they populate this milieu um of of this airship mystery uh very heavily particularly when you know you look at the uh the, the bankers and the money that would likely be uh behind all this um the del shall Mystery in itself, uh, that, that, that's quite a subject. Uh, Charles Delshaw is known as um, what they call an outsider artist. Now, some people just write off what he did as pure imagination. Um, however, when you look closer and, and you, you follow through on the leads that he provides in his story, uh, you, you begin to find um, quite a bit more substantial than just something coming out of a guy's imagination. Now, he, these books that he wrote, uh, they're actually mostly art. There was a journal he kept written in code, and the art depicts these flying contraptions, which he said the group building them uh, called Aeros. That's A-E-R-O, like uh, aeronautics, aeroplane, that kind of thing. And the, these arrows were built by this, again, the word mysterious keeps, keeps popping up, this secretive group, the Sonora Arrow Club. They took their name from Sonora, California, just uh, up there in Tuolumne County. I was just there um, last week for about four days, and or the week before last. It, it, yeah, I, I, time gets away from me here. Um, just the, the first week of this month, I was up there doing some follow-on research. Um, but they were building these contraptions and flying them around the area up there, um, uh, hiding them from the, the general public, although they would do demonstrations for you know a few people here and there that were trusted by the group. They had deals with ranchers that they would use um, special hangars um, that were constructed to look like barns. Essentially, the ranchers would allow these guys to build a barn or, or use one of their existing barns as a hangar to store and hide these uh, flying arrows. And so these uh, ranchers, uh, they happen to be Italian ranchers, because there were a few Italian immigrant members in the Sonora Aero Club, according to Del Shell. And, you know, they had quite a little uh, operation going up there. Um, and uh, Del Shell went out in the 1850s apparently to chronicle it, very possibly on behalf of the mysterious organization I mentioned before, the NIMSA. The NIMSA. The NIMSA, no. yes. Uh, that, that's a story in itself right there. Del Shell spelled this group like an acronym, all capital letters, and he spelled it N-Y-M-Z-A. Now, Many many writers have uh, uh, there's a, there's a few out there that have delved into this whole Del Shaw mystery in the Sonora Aero Club. Um, Dennis Crenshaw has d done some excellent research on this, and he worked with a man named Pete Navarro. Now Pete Navarro was the man who discovered the Del Shaw notebooks. They were on a trash heap at a junk store, and he was fascinated by them when his his eye just happened to catch them. And he purchased them from the junk man, and he was the original owner of these art books and the first guy to investigate this Del Shell mystery. 
Del Shao wrote these uh, the, or drew these drawings, painted the paintings, and uh, wrote the journal between the uh, late 1890s, I think, up until he died in 1923. And these books were just tossed out um, into the trash at this at this junk store. Well, Pete got them. He went through them. He actually, uh, d this was in Texas, by the way, where Del Shaw had uh, lived in the last years of his life. Pete came out here to California, investigated uh, the Sonora area, Columbia, Jamestown. Anyone familiar with the Gold Rush country here in California will know those places. It's just west of Yosemite. And uh, it, it was quite a big mystery. Pete uh, got some of the answers, but um, he ended up uh, having to uh, sell the books. And uh, some of them ended up uh, in the Demenil Gallery. Now, the Demenils, they have a history um, that uh, conspiracy writers have um, connected them with the whole JFK assassination milieu, but we don't even have time to go into that. But the, interestingly enough, they own some of uh, this artwork that Charles Delshaw did. And uh, Navarro wrote that book with Crenshaw. Um, Theo Pymans is another researcher who um, he really illuminated the likely connection of a guy named John W. Keeley, who allegedly also worked with um, anti-gravity from a sound resonance angle. Kind of similar to Edward Leed Skelman, who built mm -hmm. uh, the Coral Castle, for yeah. those familiar with that. Um, and uh, th then, of course, you have um, Michael Busby's research. He's the one that really dug out the names that uh, Del Shao mentioned and tied them, was able to, to bring the first threads to the 1890s airship mystery. So you have all these guys... Um, Sean Castile among them also, who wrote about the 1908 Tesla airship to Mars rumor. You have all these guys that have, it's kind of like the blind men with the elephant. They've all touched parts of the elephant. Right, right. And, you know, they, they've, they've given substantial uh, information and description to the particular part, but no one had ever really connected the whole thing in an overarching way. And I, as I was looking at the NIMSA information, you know, uh, uh, Del Shao first uh, brings uh, NIMSA into the, the, the public view. And uh, the, the whole John W. Keeley connection in the late 1800s uh, b brings in the possible NIMSA connection. I began to see that, uh, wow, I, I think this, this NIMSA thing is much bigger than just a mysterious acronym in the books of an outsider artist. Mm. And as I dove deeper into that thread, all sorts of things started popping up. Um, and, of course, it's uh, heavily German, leading right up to the World War II era and beyond. Walter, we're going to be sliding into our first commercial break. For our listeners, if you do a Google search for the following... Found in a junk shop, secrets of an undiscovered visionary artist. Just search for found in a junk shop, secrets of an undiscovered visionary artist. There is an article on a website called Messy Nessie. <laughs> kind of a cool name for a website, Messy and Nessie. And you'll see some of the drawings from this book. And these are, these are nutty drawings. I mean, they're intriguingly nutty. Uh, and I, you know, I'm looking at some of these things and as you're talking, Walter, and I'm looking at them, I'm thinking to myself, what would an average pedestrian person from the 18, the latter half of the 1800s think to themselves if they saw some, a contraption like this floating through the sky you know, across the landscape? I mean, folks, all you gotta do is do that Google uh, search, uh, Find the article, found in a junk shop, secrets of undiscovered visionary artist, pictures worth a thousand words. We're going to take our break, and we'll be right back on the other side with our guest, Robert Bosley. We're talking about the olden days of UFOG.
And welcome back to Far Out Radio on a Monday night. Walter Bosley is with us this evening. Walter will be one of the presenters at the Secret Space Program Conference in uh, Austin, Texas, uh, on October the 31st. That's Saturday, October the 31st, and November the 1st. Uh, it's, uh, we attended, if you can't make it down there to uh, Austin, Texas, you can attend the conference via the webcast. Uh, I think it's only 60 bucks. You can watch uh, all two days of the presentations. You can also have access to the uh, uh, recorded version, so you can stop and you know go back and re-listen to things. Uh, we attended the conference via the uh, uh, webcast last year, and it was a lot of fun, and uh, we were certainly looking forward to doing this again. Uh, Walter, during the commercial break, I was looking at some of those illustrations from that article, uh, found in a junk shop, secrets of an undiscovered visionary artist, very steampunk-like, really cool stuff. Now, you mentioned anti-gravity technology from the 1850s. Has that ever been sorted out as to what they were into? Well, that's the thing. The uh, Sonora Aero Club, which was this group of German immigrants, uh, led by a man named Peter Menes, um, Menace was the guy who had brought the um, propulsion mechanism, so to speak, the anti-gravity mechanism, uh, to the group. And the key to it was the uh, liquid fuel that, unfortunately, uh, he died with the recipe. Um, now, Delshaw had learned that it was mixed with water. Whatever it was was mixed with water. Um, there are some natural ingredients, but for the most part, the, the key ingredient was the secret ingredient that Menace never shared. And um, it, uh, it, it was similar to um, what's been uh, described as a mercury vortex engine, um, which involves rotation and, and this liquid. And it... Uh, it would be stored in, uh, I, I, it's not really tanks, more like reservoirs, which when you look at the art on some of these arrows, people say, well, that looks like a balloon. So naturally it was just helium in there, and because this thing was small, it was you know large enough to lift the guy up. But actually, when you read the descriptions, um, those, those shapes you see that look like bags, so to speak, were, were actually... Reservoir is not like a balloon is. It was reservoir of the product, this mysterious NB gas, which Del Shaw, uh said that Menace, Peter Menace claimed was what this stuff was. And it was the creation of that and the storing of that that gave the craft its lift and buoyancy. And no one has ever really figured it out. Hmm. Um, exactly what it is, because for the most part, most people don't take it seriously. They see Del Shao as just some crazy guy whose artwork was interesting, and he's just a you know a fun story to tell, and you know there's there's nothing to it. But uh, as I think, and as I think I've found, and others too, I, I think there's there's a lot more to it. Well, I can understand that because the artwork. Although it's very intriguing, it's kind of um, elementary and whimsical. Sure, it's very cool. Yeah. I'm surprised no one has made posters or prints of this of this artwork. I mean, it it looks too it looks overly decorated to be taken seriously. It does, but actually, the best way to look at these drawings is uh, in a book. A gallery edition, oversized pages. It's a beautiful book, hardcover, and it's put out by uh, the the Romano Gallery. A guy named Stephen Romano has gathered the biggest collection of the Del Shaw art and and done this in full color pages, full color plates, including pages handwritten, the, the actual handwritten diary pages of Del Shaw, and it's and it is the singularly the best presentation you can find out there of Del Shell's work. And what's astonishing is when you look in that book, they don't just focus on the... A lot of these articles online and stuff, these magazine articles, they pick the most whimsical um, examples, and that's what they show. What they ignore, what they don't show, are the ones that are in the Romano book, 
which actually show uh, quite a bit more of a of the um, uh, mechanism of, of the more like a, you know a, a, a drafter's art you know that, yeah. that shows a little bit more of the processes of these machines and it's really I highly recommend it um, you know if you're interested in this this mystery you've got to see the Romano gallery book uh, titled Charles Delshow fascinating um, absolutely it, fascinating it, one of the presenters at the Secret Space Program coming up in a week and a half is Catherine Austin Fitz. Now, when she was there last year, when I saw her name on the on the roster of speakers, I've been listening to Catherine for years and years on Jeff Francis' program and other programs. I thought, oh, okay, well, what's what's the money lady doing here? And uh, it's it's a legitimate question, but ah, you must always follow the money trail. Have you been able to find any kind of a money trail connected to this airship mystery from the second half of the 1800s? Oh, absolutely. There are uh, primarily some very strong likely suspects in the German banking industry. Um, I'll be presenting that in detail in Texas, but basically, uh, yes, (laughs) Um, particularly... There is one particular, um, and I know that's redundant there, um, particularly particular, there is one banker that was based in the United States who was German-born and and was connected to Germany, and he was essentially the the banker to the rail barons, and that was uh, Abraham Kuhn of Kuhn Loeb. Now, in my book, Empire of the Wheel 2, Friends from Sonora, I present the idea that Kuhn Loeb um, which became part of Lehman Brothers and, and right. such in the 20th century. Kuhn Loeb, they owned 64% of the rail lines in the United States in the uh, the second half, the early second half of the 19th century, or for most of the, the later second half of the 19th wow, century. That's, that's just huge. That's like owning 64% of the Internet today. Exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, the uh, as I point out in my book, there would have been a natural railroad um, association to the technology that I think the airships used. And that um, comes into play in what's called telluric current. Now, telluric current is an ELF, an extremely extreme low frequency of energy that runs through the planet. It's a real thing. You can look it up. And this energy was tapped into by the guys who essentially created uh, the uh, uh, telegraphy, the the telegraph um, technology and industry. And telegraph companies were owned by railroads because um, they were built with the railroads. Uh, This was how they would communicate. And, you know, it was just um, logical that if you were following the railroads, if you had to get a fast message somewhere, you know, telegraphy was it. Since the railroaders used it while they were building the railroads, they, of course, turned it into, a you know, the first, you know, communications industry, really. And they were aware of this telluric current running through the ground. Well, in my book and my research, um, what's interesting is when you look at the 1890s airship mystery, um, the path of the sightings, the paths, I should say, of the, of the sightings, um, happen to coincide with the flow of, of, flow of telluric current running through the terrain. Right, right. You know, there's a, there's a terrific uh, TV series out called Hell on Wheels, and it's about the construction of the uh, railroad system after the uh, American Civil War. And the Telegraph plays an important part of that series. And it's also worth noting with regard to this money connection that one of the big money people who was behind Nikola Tesla was George Westinghouse. The story goes was that when... Uh, Tesla showed his his uh, device for pulling electricity out of the air for free. George Westinghouse said, that's nice, but nobody's going to milk my cow for free. Uh, they always want that return on investment. I'd like to We're take our commercial break, and we'll be right back.
Welcome back to Far Out Radio on a Monday night. Walter Bosley is with us this evening. Walter will be one of the presenters at the 2015 Secret Space Program Conference in Austin, Texas on Halloween Day and the following day, Sunday, November the 1st. And Walter will be talking about the early, early days of ufology. And no, no, it didn't start in 1947 with uh, Kenneth Arnold's sighting of uh, flying saucers, flying disks out there in Washington State. And and about a week and a half later, when the uh, Roswell incident uh, occurred, no, no, it goes back almost a hundred years before. You know, Walter, on the other side of the break, you were talking about telluric energy, and it sort of tripped something off in my head. So during the commercial break, I looked up uh, Nathan Stubblefield Earth Battery. I remember hearing that story. Are you familiar with Nathan Stubblefield and his Earth Battery? Yes. Yes, uh, Stubblefield is, uh, you know, his work turns up whenever you're looking at this stuff. And uh, he turned up when I was working on uh, the the book in question, the Friends from Sonora book, a couple of years ago. Yeah, fascinating. Well, fascinating. When, you do a, when you do a Google search for Earth Battery Wiki, there is a Wikipedia page for the Earth Battery. And at the <laughs> halfway through the uh, second sentence, there is a link for Telluric currents and you can mm-hmm. go there and you can read more about telluric currents it is an electrical current which moves underground or through the sea telluric currents result from both natural causes and human activity and the discrete currents interact in a complex pattern the currents are extremely low frequency and travel over large areas at or near the surface of the earth so this is Real science, folks. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. You know, what I, I find, to, uh, what I find uh, to be so cool is that it is like a consistent pattern here. That whenever, whenever you have people who, are, who have a lot of power, money, they're always looking for what's over the horizon that they could possibly use to get an edge on the competition. Uh, they're doing it today, and they were doing it way back when. They were, I mentioned uh, George Westinghouse. Uh, being the uh, uh, funding man behind uh, Nikola Tesla in one of his projects. And I'm sure it went on back before uh, before that happened as well. Well, you know, the banker that I was speaking of before the break, Kuhn Loeb, uh, they were also um, financial backers of Westinghouse. <laughs> the backers' backers. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, you know, that, with all the Tesla connection there and the legendary connection of uh, Tesla to the uh, airship mystery, which is a, is a theory that, that's out there. What's interesting about the um, 1890s airship mystery is that uh, w- with Keeley, this John W. Keeley, um, who was for a while a contemporary um, of Tesla, um, with him involved in the mix, with this, um, the, 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 the New York side of things and the airship mystery, um, John Jacob Astor the Fourth, famous rich guy um, who died on the Titanic, he invested in both Keeley and Tesla, but for some reason he was much more interested in Keeley and didn't really do much with Tesla, interestingly enough. And you have to wonder what might uh, Tesla have accomplished had uh, Astor focused, you know, his funding more in Tesla's direction. Um, it's, it's certainly interesting in, in light of Astor's interests. Astor, a lot of people don't know, wrote a science fiction novel about an airship that uh, journeyed into space. Um, you know, talk about steampunk. And uh, so he was very much into these things. And, and this is some of the stuff that backs up the idea put out there by um, uh, Sean Castile and, and a few others that perhaps uh, Tesla was indeed involved with the building of a secret airship that journeyed to Mars, of all things, of all places, in 1908. Oh. <laughs> uh, geez, you're, you're blowing my mind here, man. <laughs> It's, uh, now, here's the interesting thing with this, Scott. Um, and, you know, we throw all these things out here. We look at Delshell's art, and we go, oh, isn't that quaint? Isn't that whimsical? You know, but ah, there can't be anything to it. And, and you know, we, you, you look up a guy like Keeley, and, you know, there was a minor scandal involved with him. He was accused of faking all this stuff and uh, that he did with uh, um, the reported uh, 
demonstrations of anti-gravity in his uh, laboratory. And, you know, you have this wild story of, you know, Tesla helped build an airship that, you know, someone journeyed to Mars in in 1908. And, and all of this sounds crazy and nutty. But then you really start looking at the details uh, behind all this. You, you really start seeing the connections, the threads that connect it to the more grounded aspects of the 1890s airship mystery of the whole Del Shao thing. And you begin to wonder how crazy, <laughs> you know, it, it really was. Um, you know, at the very least, you could imagine somebody thinking about it and attempting it. Now, you know, from our 21st um, century, you know, post-Apollo generation perspective, um, you know, we'd say, well, even if they built it and tried it, you know, they, they would have died once they left the atmosphere of the Earth, right? You know, well, we don't know. Maybe, maybe they tried. Um, but it is quite intriguing, uh, an idea, that's for sure. It really is. Now, from your research, Walter, do you have any kind of an indication of, did this technology just die or did it go silent? Because oftentimes technologies, you know, there's a technology race. I mean, right now, uh, I'm a car guy, so I follow a lot of uh, automobile technologies. And in the last 10 years, especially with the success of the Toyota Prius, battery-operated cars are, are, are starting to gain a lot of uh, popularity with the automakers. They all have battery-operated cars. The new Tesla, uh, Tesla Motors car is just an amazing piece of machinery. However, right. the idea of electric cars and battery-operated cars is over 100 years old. It's just yep. that the internal combustion engine uh, pardon the pun, got enough traction where it got ahead of battery and electric-powered automobiles, and they, they faded into the past. People have always been tinkering with these things. Uh, as, as long as I can remember, since the early 60s, somebody's been out there making a battery-powered car or whatever. Uh, it never really went anywhere. This kind of technology that we're talking about, did it, mm -hmm. go, did it just die, fade away, or do you think it went silent? Well, that's the whole purpose of my presentation in Texas. I don't think it uh, died at all. I think it definitely went into the black world. It went secret. I think that uh, those who were developing it in the 19th century became the breakaway civilizations. I think there are two of those. One uh, originated with the 19th century Germans. The other one originated with post-U.S. Civil War American industrialists. And those two breakaway civilizations emerging from the airship technology era, um, they are rivals, and they were behind, in my opinion, the uh, continued development of both known um, aerospace technologies and secret aerospace technologies. They were behind what the uh, Germans were doing in World War II. They have been behind whatever, you know, the, 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 the American uh, industrial, military industrial complex um, uh, was led to and continue to develop. And um, essentially, they are the story of um, aerospace technology and, uh, and some other technologies. And they are actually, in my opinion, um, the true story of the whole of the UFO phenomena in the 20th century. Um, I'm one of those who thinks that 90% um, of UFO reports um, in our known UFO history are, are pretty much um, Earth-originated human technology. Um, now that still leaves 10% for the other guys off-world. Um, I don't I don't disregard or dismiss or say that ET doesn't exist. What I do say is that what I just said, 90% of UFO sightings um, are Earth-originated human technology, and that's explained by these secretive breakaway civilizations that exist without really the masses being aware of them. Well, it's a very far-out thing to, to consider and ponder that the space race, as we have, as it has been popularly known since the 1960s, has been going on for a long, long time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you have a very it cool website. Has. You have a very cool website, Walter, called the uh, 
Lost Continent Library, and see uh, the website is lostcontinentlibrary.blogspot.com. You got a lot of neat stuff in there. Oh yeah, that's my uh, that's my main uh, publishing label, and it primarily publishes fiction. I also have Empire of the Wheel dot blogspot dot com, which uh, is my uh, website for my nonfiction work. And uh, I occasionally I need to go back and catch up on posts on both of them because when I get busy with research and books and presentations, um, you know I get a little behind on posting there. But it, yes, and those uh, are both uh, really uh, well. One's fun; the other one is is very intriguing. Sometimes there's not not necessarily fun information I dig up as readers of the Empire of the Wheel trilogy will will attest to. But uh, I understand what you mean. Walter, we're all out of time. It flies by when you're having fun. Thanks for being with us. I really appreciate it. And I'm very much looking forward to your presentation uh, at the Secret Space uh, Conference. Uh, what are you, like, second up? Yes, I am. I'm the, the second speaker right after Joseph Farrell, who opens the show, on Saturday, October 31st. And uh, I think you'll like it because I'm going to be presenting some information I've never talked about in my books or anywhere else. All right. Well, I am very much looking forward to it. Walter, thanks for being with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on, Scott. I, I appreciate being here. You're quite welcome. Take care, and we'll talk again soon after the program. That is our program for this evening. And uh, just to uh, wrap up our, uh, our uh, presentation of material on the Secret Space Program, this coming Friday night, our pal Tim Swartz will be with us, and we'll be talking about a book that Tim wrote back in 2012. The book's title is The Secret Space Program, who is responsible? That's this Friday night. Thanks for being with us. Have a great week, and we'll be back Friday with more Far Out Radio.